Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. We thank you for joining this time that we are getting ready to fellowship in the word of truth around the table of truth. And I want to thank you as always for being committed to coming to church. Yes, we are gathering around the word of God. We are the body of Christ. The Bible declares that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. We're God's children and wherever God's children are gathered together in his name and we are gathered together right now in the name of Jesus in the sense that we're gathering around the word of God. That's what unites us in these type settings that we're in. We are connected not by Facebook or YouTube. We are connected by the spirit of God in the word of God. These are just tools that give us the ability to be able to gather together under God's word. Well, we're getting ready to go into the word of God. I know you've been praying and perhaps already been worshiping God, preparing your heart to receive the word of God. I want to encourage you to create an atmosphere for a time to just get in God's presence and don't just, you know, take it for, uh, for granted and just run in and rush and just sit down and trying to get yourself together, but prepare your heart, prepare the way so that you can honor God and get ready to fellowship in his word. Be well rested, have your Bible prepared and have your notes and stuff in place because you are not just coming to hear Pastor Curly, you are coming to receive the word of God and that's what God is speaking unto his children. Well, let us pray. Father, we honor you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his righteousness, that we have received that righteousness today. And we declare that we are children of the Most High God. Thank you for the grace that you've given each of us, Father, that we might be able to fulfill our purpose, your purpose and plan in earth for your glory. We ask now, Father, that you will speak to our hearts. You will guide our thoughts, Father, that we might proclaim the revelation of the word of God, that the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us into all truth and that father we will be fully equipped for every good work for the glory of God it's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray amen well we are continuing to minister from the thought of concerning the anointed and according to second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 and 21 every child of God everyone who has the Spirit of God on the inside of their heart they possess the anointing. The scriptures reads like this, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ Jesus, and so through him, amen, is spoken by us to the glory of God. That simply means that we agree with God's word. We agree with what God has said in his word. Amen means that it's settled. I agree with God. And then it goes on. Now it is God who makes both you and us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. This is what makes us different to make a difference. It is the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ that's in and upon our lives. Today, I want to focus on another area of the anointing. You know the anointing of God, it just canvases so many areas of our lives. And today, I want to focus on that area that has to deal with the power whenever we pray. Whenever we are praying, the power of God must be present, and that is the anointing of God. And I want us to learn as Christians to how to depend on the anointing in times of prayer. The other Sunday after we were worshiping God in such an awesome time of just going back and forth, just speaking to God, and that's what worship does. And, I, and then I stood up and I said that uh, in our worship experience, it is a form of prayer. We are praising God, we are responding to God, or we are communing with God. Not only are we communing with God, but we're also communicating with God, and we are committing our hearts to God. You see, in true worship, when you are worshiping God, it is personal. Yes, it's because of your personal relationship with him. And people begin to give expression to that when they're lifting up holy hands and when they're waving their hands and when they're making various gestures and expression and even sometimes prostrating themselves in the presence of God in their worship. That is a form of prayer because you're communing with God. 
And I don't know about you, but you go back and forth. You're praising God because of who he is. And then you're thanking God for answered prayers. Or you're beginning to pray. And then you're beginning to just give thanks unto the Lord, which is a form of prayer. And then in the midst of that, God can speak things to your heart. Because why? He could be searching out your heart in the midst of your worship. While you're in the presence of God, Spirit of God is searching your heart. And there's anything like sin, you're going to find yourself repenting. You're going to be finding yourself just humbling yourself before God right in the midst of worship. So in a sense, true worship is a form of prayer or praying. When our worship is reduced to a person or personality or performance, we forfeit the anointing. Oh yeah, you may be carrying out an act, but the presence of God is not there. Because God knows when people's hearts are focusing on a person. That's why sometimes when certain people haven't come to church yet, oh man, if the musician is not in place, if the singers are not in place, people looking around, what are we going to do? You're going to worship. You're going to worship. You're there to worship God. Things can happen and things can happen in people's lives at the last moment. And I've seen some people think, well, so-and-so is not here. Or get this, the preacher didn't make it. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to worship God. Somebody's supposed to be in that house that have the word of God in their heart and they're going to stand up like a Hazi in, in the Bible when Jehoshaphat and them was facing the enemy. Jehazi stand up and say, the spirit of the Lord is speaking to me. Listen, listen. You don't have to have a title for the spirit of God to come upon you and speak to you, but you got to be sensitive to the spirit and there's got to be people witnessing right what you're saying so they can say, yes, that is the word of God. I'm just saying we got to be careful that we're not worshiping a person or a personality or we're coming for performance. Because what we do, as I said, we uh, forfeit the anointing. And I don't know about you, but once you tap into the anointing of God in your life, you know it's the anointing that makes the difference. Well, when it comes to our prayers, when it comes to our prayer life, I believe there are certain things that you and I have to do relative to the anointing to have that power present and in, in fueling our prayers. And the first one is this, is that when our prayers are more God-centered than self-centered. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3 in your Bibles because I believe that makes a difference of the degree of the anointing that we sense in our prayers. Is that our prayers are more God-centered than self-centered. So in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 through 19, the Apostle Paul prays two prayers in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 15 through 23, he prays there in the prayer. And in chapter 1, is mainly centered around the spiritual enlightenment of the believers. But here in chapter 2, this prayer is primarily centered around the spiritual enablement, or we can say the spiritual empowering of the saints of God. This kind of praying will attract the anointing of God, will cause that anointing to be released through your prayers. Because at the heart of your prayer, and I want you to grab this now, at the heart of your prayer is God honoring attitude toward the church. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. The, at the heart of your prayer is a God honoring attitude toward the church. It's important for believers to separate their religious experiences from their kingdom experiences. That's a difference. In a lot of religious experiences, people have been beat up and wounded. Religion will do that to you. Yeah, religion will do that to you. But not kingdom experiences. Because you'll find out that in the kingdom of God, it's not about the flesh of men. It's not about people having their own way. It's not about little factions in the church, little groups in the church trying to run the church. Not families who consider themselves the greatest of the families trying to rule the church. Not a bunch of deacons thinking it's their job to run the church. No, no, that's religion. That's a house of religion and you get beat up in that house. You get all kinds of scars and wounds. But in the kingdom of God, you and I want a kingdom experience. You say, what does a kingdom experience look like? Well, Romans 14 and 17 gives us a beautiful picture. The scripture says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. What's that? Fleshly stuff, religious stuff, 
law and all of that things of bondage so the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking for this context it was the eating and drinking of food that was offered to idols and things of that nature that were creating that kind of division in the church and basically Paul said that's not the kingdom that's, <laughs> that's religion that's the tradition of men but he goes on to say but the kingdom of God is righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That's the experience you and I want to have in church where we're experiencing the righteousness of God, where we're experiencing the peace of God and where we're experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have to experience it in our heart first. Sometimes we look for this from somebody else, but we have to take, mind for, uh, take responsibility for our own hearts and make sure that out of our heart, there's a kingdom of anointing of peace and joy through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, our attitude affects the degree of the anointing in our lives. And if you have the wrong attitude toward the kingdom of God, toward the church, I'm not talking about religion, I'm not talking about a religious house, I'm talking about the kingdom of God, it will affect the flow of the anointing in your life. It will affect the flow of the anointing in a church when leadership is more bound by religion and traditions of men than by the word of God. So notice what Paul says in this prayer. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, for this reason or for this cause. What is it? He's given us the motivation behind his prayer. Paul's motivation for this prayer is seen in verse 15. Listen here. For from whom the whole family and heaven and earth is named. I mean, glory to God. I mean, if you got God in your heart while you're in the earth, heaven is guaranteed you. So don't be working. Don't be saying, you know, I'm trying to do what it takes to get to heaven. All you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Repent of your sins. Ask Christ to come in. Too many people are trying to get to heaven. Jesus have already made heaven available to us. There's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. We can say this. There's no other name given to us, no other authority, but of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can enter heaven. So if you're going to be in God's heaven, you've got to have God's gift of eternal life. And so Paul here, his motivation is his love for the family of God. You've got to have a love for God's family. You've got to, again, I'm not talking about your religious experience. In your religious experiences, even in mine, you'll find a religion will beat you up and scar you and run you out of the church. And that's a good thing. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. But righteousness, peace, and joy. That's the kingdom of God. I remember we sang that song. Righteousness, peace, and joy. That's, that is the kingdom of God. And when you get in the kingdom of God, God's going to give you some kingdom experiences. And one of the experiences, you're going to understand the anointing. And you're going to see how the anointing affects your prayer life. And your prayers are not just going to be self-centered. They're going to be God-centered. You're going to think bigger than your little local church. You're going to think much bigger than your little community. Thank God for praying for your church. Thank God for praying for your community. But there's an anointing that will reach nations. Hallelujah. There's an anointing that recognizes that we do not fight against flesh and blood but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this present world. There is an anointing in prayer that recognizes that I'm able to overcome the works of the devil. Hallelujah. That's the kingdom of God. Well, he goes on, and I want to bring out some things here because Paul is specific in his prayer. See, faith is, is specific. When we're praying, we don't need to be vague. We don't need to be acting like, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know, if, you know, if, if it's going to work or not. No, we need to be specific because God hears the heart of faith. God hears those who, who have an understanding in their heart of his ability, of his promises, and of his power. And so here we see then he begins, first of all, in verse 16. This is the specifics of his prayer now. He said that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit 
and the inner man. So the first thing we see here is that the inner person might know spiritual strength. That is the prayer that Paul is praying. That these believers will understand the where their strength come from. From the inner man. Matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, the scripture reveals that the Holy Spirit empowers us from within through the word of God in prayer. That's why when believers are not spending time in God's word, when they are not spending time in prayer, they are not going to have that strength on the inside of their inner man. And so in 2 Corinthians 6 and, I mean 4 and 16, the scripture says, Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Notice, do not lose heart. Do not throw away your faith, your confidence. Don't turn away from trusting God. Why? Because though things may look a certain way in the natural, and though even in the natural there are certain things that your emotions and things may experience, yet your inner man, is being renewed day by day. How is that inner man being renewed? Because you are fellowshipping in the word of God each day. Because you are praying. That's how you feed the inner man. That's how you nourish the inner man. The early church gave themselves to prayer because they understood this. So in, each, in Acts chapter 6 verse 4, listen to this. The scripture says, But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Those spiritual leaders knew we can't be running around here doing all of this uh, natural things, being caught up in the affairs of this world and all of a sudden trying to shepherd God's flock, trying to hear from God and feed and nourish up God's flock. We got to take time. We got to have spiritual disciplines so we give ourselves over to prayer and to the word. Man, when you're feasting on the word through the week, God will begin to feed you what he wants you to feed the sheep on Sunday. Now, if you just wait till Saturday night and you're going to go listen to somebody else's videos and all that stuff there, man, that may not be the meal God has for your house. You remember that time when man preachers were going around, everybody trying to find somebody to say, oh, I'm going to get under this person, so what they have, I'm going to get all that carnality, all that was flesh. What was God doing to the church before these people ever came on the earth? He was building his church because he declared the gates of hell would not be able to prevail against it. So don't get caught up in these little fads and movements of fleshly men. Be led by the Spirit of God. Let God guide you and lead you. This thing is not about us building a name for ourselves or trying to create greatness or some kind of relevance in our life. We are we who we are by the grace of God. That's what Satan offered Jesus in those temptations. You want to be relevant? You want to have power in this world? You want to have influence in this world? You want the world to look up to you? Bow down and worship me. Jesus would not even bow down to that agenda of the devil. Why? Because he didn't come to do his own will. He didn't come to be a great king in the earth. He didn't come so people could follow him because of the material things he had. He came to carry out a mission to give his life as a ransom for the sins of the world. He came to suffer. He came to go to the cross. He knew his purpose and he never let anybody get him off course. He didn't allow his disciples. He told Peter on one occasion, I rebuke you, get behind me, Satan. In other words, Peter tried to get him out of the will of the Father to avoid going through suffering, to avoid going through rejection. Hallelujah. Jesus knew why he came. You got to know your purpose so you won't run with every fad and every doctrine of men, every cunning craftiness that's out there today. Just walk with Christ. Hallelujah. There's another specifics to Paul prayer. In verse 17, he said that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. In other words, that Christ may feel at home in their hearts. Oh, that's very important that Christ feel at home in our hearts when we find, when he find that there's faith and love in our hearts. When he see that our hearts are inspired by faith and love, Christ dwells there. Hallelujah. The word rooted means a steady position. It's like a tree that is, uh, is, is, is planted in this rich soil and it's rooted. It's not easily moved. And there's so many people are not rooted in love. They're not rooted in the word. 
I'm not because you sound worthy, not because when you pray, people say, oh man, when they pray, they just can pray them scripture. That don't mean you're rooted in the word of God. You might, that just might be surface stuff. It's when you are facing challenges and when you're rooted and grounded in love, you're not going to be swayed and moved by the flesh and by the works of the devil. Well, the greatest way to see the fruit of the spirit blossoming in our lives is when we are rooted in spiritual things. Let me say that again. The greatest way to see the fruit of the spirit. Oh, yeah, we have the fruit of the spirit, but it's got to blossom. It's got to bloom. And the greatest way to have that fruit blooming in your life is when you're rooted in spiritual things. Notice he goes on in verse 18. He said that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. In other words, the, comp the word comprehend means to apprehend. It means to be able to take hold of. And so what Paul is saying here, he prays that they may lay hands on these wonderful blessings that God has provided his children through revelation and personal experiences. There's some fruit that's going to come out of your life because of the experiences that you have to go through in life. It's going, that fruit is going to blossom. And what the enemy meant for evil, don't realize, is drawing you closer to the heart of God. It's causing you to come to terms and have those reflective moments and examining yourself, taking inventory of your heart to see whether or not you are in the faith. That's how we're supposed to examine ourselves according to the scriptures to see whether we're in the faith or whether we are walking after the flesh. And so now we're able to lay hold to the promises of God. And how do we do that? We do it by faith. Of all the wonderful promises that God has given us, love is the one promise that is immeasurable. There is no limit to the power of God's love. In 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible says, love shall never fail. That doesn't mean things may not, uh, uh, that, that doesn't mean things won't happen and people won't do certain things, but in your heart, the word that the love of God will never fail. You never get to a point where you should excuse yourself for not walking in love, for not beginning to make sure you're keeping God's love blossoming on the inside of your heart. Well, the other specifics I see in this particular prayer is in verse 19. He said, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So we're to be specific, to be filled with the fullness of God. It is impossible to be full with, filled with God's goodness, to be filled with God's grace, and to be filled with the things of the world. And when we have God's grace, God's fullness, on the inside of our heart, we don't have space for the spirit of the world, the, the things of the world, which 1 John 2, 15 tells us, what is the things of the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The Bible says you cannot love the Father and the world at the same time. But there is a fullness that God wants all of his children to walk in. Matter of fact, in John chapter 1, verse 16, listen to what the scripture says, the Amplified Bible. For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace in truth, we have all received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon faith, favor, and gift heat upon gift. We've all received this, but we got to know that. And we got to understand that. You know, this new movement about, you know, this extreme grace teaching, people got to realize, this ain't no new revelation. It's taken to the extreme by those who think they want to be great and have something and be relevant and, and want to be the one who the first one to grab something new. Be careful of that when you go in the scriptures. People who want to be deep. The highest authority is the word of God. And so often people put individuals as the highest authority. And if so-and-so say it, they just believe because of the person who said it, it must be true. No. Let God be true and every man a liar. Examine the scriptures. 
Grace is nothing new. Grace is no new doctrine. Hallelujah. We're saved by grace. We are who we are by the grace of God. Grace never fails. Grace never leaves us. Grace draws us closer to God. Get this. Grace calls us to honor God with tithes and offering. Hallelujah. You don't let nobody tell you because of grace that tithing is part of the law. That's doctrine of devils. That's a seducing spirit. Hallelujah. Man, we need to honor the Lord with the front. We need to try to honor God with everything that he brings in our heads. We need to look for every opportunity that we can advance the kingdom of God. We need to look for every opportunity that we can sow in the, into the things of God. You wonder why sometime, and I thought about this, when people claim, you know, okay, you know, this is what I taught, but yeah, you know, it was wrong, throw all this away. Well, then, you know, Zacchaeus, he did some things with money. And he felt bad about it after he had had an encounter with Jesus. And he didn't just come back and say, well, you know, I've been mishandling money. I've been operating in greed and covenants. And I've been taking advantage of people. And I've been manipulating people to get their money. He didn't come back and just say all that. You know what he said? He said, I will give back all that I've taken unfairly. I'll give them four times. Oh, well, I think people, if they're really sincere, they want to go a little further and say, you know what? All that I've gained. By this teaching I've been doing on prosperity, I want to bring it back and I want to give it back. People I've taken advantage of through this false teaching, I want to give it back. Oh no, ain't no giving back. <laughs> ain't no giving back. I'm just saying we got to be careful now. Grace is no new doctrine. Grace been here ever since creation. Ever since the creation of the world, grace has been here. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ came and he blessed, brought a witness of it. He lived it in front of us. Hallelujah. But we are saved by grace through faith. Not of works least any man shall boast. Well, Colossians 2, 9 and 10, listen to this. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and every authority. Jesus is the head over every power and every authority. What I'm talking about different to make a different a difference to make a difference, talking about the anointing, how it impacts our prayer life. Our prayers have to be more God-centered than self-centered. You got to have a love for the church. Don't let your religious experience cause you to be able to just have a negative attitude toward the church. And people get to the point where they'll say stuff like this. I don't want nothing else to do with church. I'll serve God in my own way. I'll serve God at home. I'll do my own little home church. That's not the scripture. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves coming together. God has a body of believers that he brings together. You don't get to change that order. That's a kingdom order. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Notice the togetherness of the saints. Well, let's move on. I think another way that our prayers are impacted by the power of the anointing is when our prayers releases the power of heaven. I've heard someone say one time, when you may have asked them, could I pray for you? Or, and you know, they uh, perhaps may respond, well, uh, I guess, you know, it ain't going to hurt. In other words, they're saying just, you know, like everything else, let's just throw some hooks out in the water and maybe, uh, maybe that hook might catch something. Well, people that think like that, they don't understand the power of prayer. They don't see prayer as God's power that's being released out of heaven. I want to encourage you, don't look at prayer as a possibility. That's what they're saying. If there may be a possibility that it may work and they may be doing some other things. They may be, you know, doing some little uh, 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 traditional things to try to, you know, crossing their fingers and knocking on wood. They may be doing all of that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they'll tell you, well, yeah, prayer, it can't hurt. Well, I want to encourage you that prayer has the ability to do the impossibility. Hallelujah. That's what prayer does. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, now I'm going to just paraphrase it here for the sake of time. We have a scene where a father is seeking aid from Jesus' disciples and casting a demon out of his son. 
Jesus approaches and asks the father what is happening and the father answers is that the disciples have failed to cast the demon out of my son. Jesus team. Jesus, uh, uh, those he had been mentoring, those he had the anointing, those who had witnessed the power of God casting out demons and come back to Jesus and rejoicing that the demons are subject to them now is at a point where they are lacking faith. The scriptures reveal that. In verse 19, Jesus said, You unbelieve in a faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Now, now, in verse 22, the Bible says the father then asked Jesus to have pity on them and cast the demon out. The disciples couldn't do it, Jesus. But, 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 but Jesus, will you have pity or compassion on us and cast the demon out my son? Listen how Jesus responded in Mark chapter 9, verse 22 and 23. But Jesus said to him, if you are able to believe, all things are possible to one who believes. And immediately the father of the boy cried out with tears, said, I do believe, Lord, help my unbelief. In other words, there's an element of humility in this man's prayer. But Jesus is trying to get this man to realize the object of your prayer is right in front of you. It's not your authority, it's not human authority, it's divine authority. It's the authority of heaven that has the power to get results in these type situations. Medicine can't get demons out of a person. No, it takes the power of God. It takes that anointing that's being released out of heaven to be able to break the powers of darkness off people's lives. And that's what Jesus is informing him. We have to understand that faith has two aspects. There's the objective and the subjective. The objective part of faith is the part of faith that depends totally on the source who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we put faith in Jesus, when we put faith in his authority, it is an unshakable faith. Because Jesus is an unshakable God. And then there's the subjective aspect of our faith. And this is where hesitancy and doubt can enter the scene. But here we must remember that we give ourselves over to trust in the power of the object of our faith, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and trust in his trustworthiness. He is a faithful God. He is faithful to his promises. Oh, the enemy can attack you and try to cause fear and doubt, but when Jesus Christ is the object of your faith, when you're saying, I'm not walking by feeling, I'm not walking by what my sense realm knowledge is communicating to me, but I'm walking in the fact that Jesus Christ is the God of authority. And he declared in his word, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth, and you can go and do my will. You can go and declare my word because I've given you authority over all the works of the devil and nothing he does can harm you. But he said in this, don't rejoice, but rejoice because your names are read in the Lamb's book of life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Boy, that anointing in our prayers calls heaven power to be released in the behalf of God's people. Now, I want you to listen to Mark 9, 29, uh, 28 and 29, how later on after Jesus, he did deliver that boy. He got that demon out of him. Hallelujah. He set him free by the power of the authority of, of heaven. In verse 28, he said, after arriving back home, his disciples cornered Jesus and asked, why couldn't we throw the demon out? He answered, there is no way to get rid of this kind of demon except by prayer. Hallelujah except by prayer. Another translation say prayer and fasting. What Jesus is telling them is this. You have to absolutely depend upon God. You can't depend upon yourself. 
You can't depend on what you see and how it seems like you're praying and, and, and then while you're praying for the boy, all of a sudden he's convulsing and while you're praying for him, all of a sudden demons are throwing him all over the place. He said, don't get moved by that. Don't get moved by that. Keep your heart set on the authority of the word, the authority of Jesus because it's by Jesus' authority that these demons are subject to that name. It is by the authority of heaven that they are subject unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And then the Bible tells us in Matthew 9, 29, when these uh, uh, two blind men came to Jesus, crying out to him, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus asked him, do you believe I can do this? And they said, yes, Lord. And I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, they said, yes, Lord. And then he said this in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith and trust and reliance, on the power invested in me, be it done to you. Boy, I like that. According to your faith in the power that's invested in Jesus, let it be done unto you. And how many know they received their miracle? Hallelujah. They received their sight. You see, Isaiah 10, 27 says this, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Notice, the yoke shall be destroyed because the anointing is there. Hallelujah. Because that anointing is present and that yoke will be destroyed. That thing going to be lifted off of your life because of the anointing and so when we pray and we depend on that anointing it causes heaven power to be released for the glory of God and finally our prayers have the anointing through humility our prayers are fueled through humility that's very important because sometimes when people are praying, they got so much pride present and they're more concerned about what people may say and all of you gotta you gotta die to all of that carnality. You gotta you gotta get so set and focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and his presence and his power that you yearly, you 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 literally roll yourself over totally on him. That's what happened in the case and Luke chapter 7, this woman, uh, she comes to Jesus. Simon invited him to the house, but he didn't tap into that anointing. It was this woman who came with the right heart. It was this woman who operated in such humility that she was able to tap into that anointing. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, it reads like this. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and, and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume, with perfume. Notice, she kept doing this. She was just rushing in and just hurried up and do something. But she was at the feet of Jesus. She was pouring her heart out before the Lord. She was in such humility that, 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 that her heart was speaking, even if her mouth was not making a request. Because of the anointing and because of the humility, God was able to hear the cry of her heart of exactly what she really needed in her life. And therefore, Jesus used her as an example to Simon to teach them what love for God looks like and what love for God will cause you to do when you're in the presence of that anointing. You won't be here trying to judge and you won't be here standing around looking to see how I'm going to relate and respond to people that you've already judged as sinners. You're not going to sit there with a spirit of judgment. No, and that happens a lot of times. People in church and they're just looking around trying to judge other people's response to God. 
and trying to sit there and determine if or not they're sincere and trying to determine all of this. See, you all out of the will of God. You're all in the flesh and you're missing a God moment for your own life. And here this woman is, she comes and she falls down and she begins to, to, to worship God and, and, co and commune with God. But listen to what Jesus said to this woman in Luke 7, 48. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The scripture does not say anything about her making a request for the Lord to forgive her, but when that anointing is present and there's humility, God reads the heart. God knows what the need is in your life. God knew that the need in this woman's life was spiritual in nature. She needed forgiveness of sin. And Jesus gave and answered the cry of her heart. And he let her know that her sins were forgiven. And he didn't stop there. In verse chapter 7 verse 50, he said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Oh God, glory to God. He, he, can you imagine this woman? Faith when she left? She had faith when she came in the presence of Jesus? She had faith when she was pouring out her heart and pouring that ointment on him and washing it with her hair and tears and doing all that. Not to be seen. Not so that people can look at her. She was totally surrendered to God in all humility. And now Jesus informs her that this is the kind of faith that's going to cause the power of God to manifest in your life the rest of your life. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Go live totally free from any bondage. Go live free from any brokenness. Go live free from any burden that's ever tried to come upon your life. Go in the shalom, the blessings, the favor, the prosperity of the Lord for the rest of your life. Hallelujah. She approached Jesus with such humility. The anointing makes us different so that we can make a difference. Hallelujah. And one of the ways we make a difference is through our prayers. Our prayers ought to be more God-centered than self-centered. Our prayers should be releasing the power of heaven. And our prayers should be fueled with humility. Hallelujah. This is why the enemy fight your prayer life. This is why the flesh war against your prayer life. You got two forces coming against your prayer life. You got the enemy because he knows the power that takes place on your, in your inner man as you fellowship in the word of God and as you fellowship in prayer with God. He knows that power, that strength that you're going to have in your inner man. And so when he tries to come against you, you can rebuke him in the name of Jesus. You can speak to that mountain and command it to be removed. You can command the devil to leave in the authority of Jesus' name. And then even your own flesh, that's what happened with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Wonder what they were doing, that they were not building up their spirit man. So when they felt that sleep coming on them in that hour, they would have been strong enough in their spirit man to resist that need to go to sleep and yield themselves to prayer and intercession along with Jesus. Partnering with Jesus in prayer. I have some faith action questions. The first one is this, and this is to help us to take what we're hearing and put faith to work. To see how it fit in the context of our lives and how we can grow through this teaching. The first question is, have you listened or written down your prayers lately? If so, what seemed to be the overruling factor of your heart? One thing about having reflective moments or journaling is you're able to go back and look and it can tell you and reveal to you exactly what is the overruling factor motivating your prayers. And you'll be able to see through this journal or praying 
Are your prayers God-centered or are they self-centered? Are you quickened that even when you're watching the news, immediately prayer rises up in your heart? When you hear certain things, prayer rises up in your heart. When you hear things going on in other parts of the world, prayer rises up in your heart and you, and you act on what's coming up in your heart. See, only God can inspire that kind of anointing in your life. The second question is, how do you depend on the anointing doing prayer? Some people depend on feelings doing prayer. You want to depend on the anointing. You want to know, first of all, I have God's anointing. And as you worship God, you're just going to begin to sense uh, different degrees of God's presence and God's anointing there. And man, when that anointing is there, there are times you're going to have such confident faith. There are times when that anointing is present in prayer, you're going to see some supernatural faith manifest. You're going to see yourself confessing and declaring some things in prayer by the Spirit of God that you never thought of. And you're going to have such confidence in that, such a, an assurance. You're going to begin to thank God for the answer right in prayer. You're just going to know in your hearts of heart, this thing is settled, this thing is done, and you're going to begin to give God thanks and give God praise. The last question is, is there any personal repentance during your prayer time? Boy, when that prayer anointing is present, there are times, man, God will just put certain things before your heart that's already there. He'll bring it up. Not so you can be guilty and condemned, but so you can just take a moment and say, Lord, forgive me for that. Or Lord, I release that person. Or God, I release that they've done unto me. Right in the midst of prayer, and that anointing will come, where there's some hum that, that humility will flow out of your heart, and you will find yourself uh, repenting for some things that God is bringing up in the forefront of your heart. Again, not to condemn you, not to make you feel guilty while you're handling it in prayer. That's why you're, you're, you are casting that care on God in prayer. You are causing that yoke to be destroyed in prayer. You're causing that burden to be removed in prayer because of the anointing. Hallelujah. Well, I want to thank you for staying with me around the table of truth. I'm excited about these teaching on the anointing. I know you've heard me. That's on the anointing. I've taught on the anointing and I've, I've, I've multiple times. But every time there's fresh manna because the Bible tells us that he will anoint us with fresh oil. And man, there's some fresh oil God is pouring through the Holy Spirit to the church. And I want to encourage you to make sure you're grabbing on to it. And don't tune it out like, well, I've heard that before. No, no, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you keep building up yourself in the things of God. Paul prayed for the saints of God. And you got to have the right attitude for the church to, to, to pray for the saints. Again, separate your religious experiences from the kingdom experience. Hallelujah. And that's why you don't want to be in a religious house because if you're in a religious house, all you're going to do is have religious experiences. People competing with people, people comparing themselves with people, people performing, people get mad because, you know, my child didn't get the saying and why this person got to lead the song all the time. All that carnality, all that carnality. And there go, you know, those uh, carnal leaders trying to manage that carnal type setting. No, no, we're in the kingdom of God. God has given gifts. He's given anointings to the church. We need to know when those gifts are given to the church, it's given for the good of the church and for the edification of the whole body. Not so one person can try to outshine somebody or create their own little ministries and all this stuff. No, no. We're here to carry out God's will through our local church. Well, God bless you and thank you for gathering with me around the table of truth. And I pray God's blessings on your prayer life this week that, that you're going to put those spiritual disciplines in place and you're going to get back to those things. Hallelujah. Stop rushing. Stop letting life drive you. Stop thinking, you know, you got to be there. You got to be here and be there and just rushing and rushing. Take time to rest. Take time and you get in the presence of God. I don't care if it's just five minutes. Let that be five minutes totally committed to God. No phone or anything else around you. Listen, the world is not going to dissolve because you wasn't there. And if it does, guess what? You're going to be in heaven. So some people think, boy, if they're not there to hold everything together, you better stop trying to hold it all together and learn how to trust and depend on the anointing. That's a lot of stress. 
trying to hold everything together. He might be a controller. Could be fear motivated that. But last time I read, the Bible tells us that we're to cast our cares upon the Lord, for he cares for us. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus' name.